Okay. Okay. So we are very uh, glad to have Alexander uh, 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 here. Uh, so Alexander uh, is a PhD at Princeton, and he's at Harvard, and now he's at CERN. And uh, he's been working in this very exciting field on uh, these bootstrap methods uh, in uh, in the UK. Thank you, Suvrat. It's a great pleasure to be here, and thanks for giving me a chance to talk about some things that I feel excited about. So you might have heard uh, lately a lot about conformal bootstrap, and uh, the, so my subject of my talk is S-matrix bootstrap. So why, why is that? Um, yes, yeah, the, the, re the reason, there are several reasons. Um, I don't know which one are really true, correct fully, or some maybe are. Not quite, but uh, as you might know, that the, the golden time for S matrix bootstrap was the 60s, somewhat. If you go back 50 years ago and uh, you, you read the papers, there are really many exciting results. People understood uh, complex structure, analytic structure of the amplitude, dispersion relations, proved some, some exciting theorems, understood what this inversion formula is these days, developed some bootstraps, but then, and then discovered Venetiano amplitude. But then, in a sense, at least sometimes, this program considered to be a failure. Well, to start with, it fails to solve any theory. So we don't know, we know some S matrices in higher than two dimensions, but we don't know any, any non trivial S matrix in dimensions higher than two. Um, also, there are some exciting developments which were supposed to be universal, say, so Regi theory. And uh, it's indeed very impressive what people did back then. Uh, but again, if you look, um, if you look at the data of proton-proton scattering at LHC, and say there is this paper by Donici and Lanshoff from 1992 with this um, one-sentence abstract that Regge theory is a very simple and economical description to describe all total cross sections. It's a paper in her page. And uh, again, it's, uh, it's some phenomenological plot, which is very successful. It violates a Frosser bound. So what is the high energy limit of QCD? We don't, so this seems to be universal, but even this, this also has not been solved. Uh, but then you ask, okay, why does it fail? And especially in light of um, uh, the recent success of conformal bootstrap. Um, first of all, it's not, at least it's not clear to me. In particular, why conformal bootstrap is so successful and say S-matrix bootstrap is not. And when you start thinking about it, you see that uh, one, one of the reasons is that um, people in the 60s, they were very ambitious, they were trying to solve QCD right away. The, the, they were all obsessed with pion scattering. There are bootstrap bounds on pion scattering from the 60s. Uh, but uh, these days, in a conformal bootstrap, you adopt a little bit different strategy. You try to understand the space of uh, theories, you try to find bounds, you try to find special theories, and it's not obvious, and that was one of the arguments that's usually given against S-matrix bootstraps, that why QCD is special, there are many gauge theories, many matter. So uh, then you think, okay, why don't we try to um, um, analyze the space of S-matrices, and, uh, and moreover, uh, why don't we try numerical methods, as were very successful successful in the conformal bootstrap? And so, if you go to back to the literature, you see that uh, people didn't really try. People were trying only QCD, first of all, and secondly, they haven't developed a nice numerical methods. So. Um, it's 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 not clear that it wouldn't work, and it's it's such a it's, if, you, if you read all these papers, it has such a beautiful structure, so um, I think we should uh, try again. Well, and as it goes, there is this famous quote, try again, fail again, but it should fail better. Somehow the failure of this matrix from the 60s does not look satisfactory, at least to me. And the second reason is that you might have uh, seen recently there was um, uh, an attempt by, uh, I guess, by... Uh, João Penedonas, Pedro Veiro, Miguel Paulos, um, Toledo, and uh, Balfan Reyes uh, to do some S-matrix bootstrap numerically. And uh, 
Uh, we will discuss these results. They are interesting, they are puzzling, they open many challenges, and they clearly, I think, invite for, for more, uh, more thoughts. So, um, the literature on the... So, and I will be talking about some analytic methods. The literature on the analytic as metrics bootstrap is huge. You can choose your favorite book. Uh, but I found uh, surprising, what I found surprising, and especially in light of these numerical results, there are a few results which somehow evaded, uh, which I haven't seen discussed in any books, but I found extremely interesting, and uh, I think they deserve not to be forgotten. So the goal of the, my lecture, first lecture, will be to tell you these results. Basically, I will read these papers for you. You probably haven't read them. If you read them and know them better, please correct uh, my... Uh, my explanations, uh, and then I will tell you about some new results, maybe in light of the recent development uh, developments in conformal bootstrap, but the same the S metric. So, the topics which I um, which I chose, I can write everywhere, right? So, um, the first talk, I will talk about uh, the, the topic which we will discuss and some uh, topic which is not actually present in conformal bootstrap and it's uh, very beautiful, it's, uh, it's elastic unitarity. And uh, we will discuss two classic results, we'll try to prove them, so that uh, one is the uh, Axe theorem and the second is the Gribov theorem. Both results are from the 60s, essentially. Um, in the second talk, we, I will talk about uh, frossard gibber formula. This is the same as inversion formula, and here uh, I will uh, talk about something I will call the Threshold expansion. And what is known as, a, or let me call it a dragged bootstrap. Dragged is the name of a guy who wrote a paper in the 60s. Um, and also I will hope we can discuss this uh, few uh, a few results on top of that, which uh, let me call them Martin Roy bound and the uh, corresponding result of Paula Spenedones, Toledo, Van Rees, Vieira. And finally, in a, in a third talk, I will discuss what, uh, let me call it, Gravitational What's that in the brackets next to Martin It's uh, Paulus, Penedones, Toledo, Van Reis, Veira. Yeah. Gravitational uh, superconvergence. And uh, what me, let me call it as a string equivalence principle. So this is where I will talk a little bit about strings. So uh, that's the plan. This is basically the first talk will be the reading of ancient papers, which you haven't seen. The second will be uh, based on uh, also this reading, but also on the work in progress with uh, Amit, Sever, and Madalena Lemos. And the third talk will be based on a paper to appear soon with uh, Murat Palaglu, Peter Kravchuk, and David Simmons Duffin. So that's the plan, and please uh, um, interrupt me and ask uh, questions. Um, okay, let's discuss a little bit what is the object and uh, that we would like to study. So we would like to introduce the S matrix. We have a set of in states, set of out states. So initial and final, and we have a transition between the two. And the states are labeled by moment of the particles. So you imagine the experiment where 
particles are widely separated. So I will assume for, for these two parts, we will be dealing with quantum field theory. It's gapped. Um, it's an interesting question, which, which of these parts will generalize uh, to gravitational theories. And uh, so they have some mass and they're on shell. Now, uh, as you know, the S matrix so it describes uh, you take some out state and you look at for the transition amplitude with the in state, and the probability is given by a square of this. So if you if you consider some initial state, which is a superposition of uh, whatever states, and you evolve it essentially through the say Minkowski spacetime with the S matrix. You want the norm of the state to be preserved. So if you write, say, psi, psi out as a S psi in from the fact that you want psi out, psi out to be equal psi in, psi in, you get the fact that the S matrix is unitary. So that's a first important property of the thing. Now, uh, usually in this uh, business, we write S matrix as a so-called one plus IT, and uh, one corresponds to to no scattering. So, in particular, we will be interested for the rest of the for the rest of the talks in a 2 to 2 scattering, so we can get rid of these things. This would be object of interest, so we sandwich, we sandwich this relation uh, between some state, say, P3, P4. Uh, we can label them by momentum because of the on-shell condition. And, uh, So the uh, the one part gives you the the usual thing. Say so let's say p1, p3, p2, p4, plus the same thing with uh, four, and we get the what is known as the connected piece. Uh, let me introduce this notation. This is a, a Lorentz invariant scalar product. So if you have say Q slash P, it's equal to simply two P to pi T minus one delta function. And this guy is of course just P squared plus N squared. Now, uh, the, of course, the, all the interesting part comes in here, and uh, so let's study this matrix element. And uh, usually, we, we because uh, we know that, well, we assume the theory is Lorentz invariant, so we have a momentum-preserving delta function. times an amplitude called t. And uh, this function t uh, is a function of so-called Mandelstam invariants, which are defined as follows. And I write them also in the center of mass frame. And there is a U, which is the same thing. And S plus T plus U is equal to 4 N squared. Uh, the dimensionality of this, uh, of this object 
is, uh, you can figure it out, it's 4 minus d, so it's dimensionless in four dimensions. And then uh, uh, we have this constraint. So usually it's useful to think about um, this object in the so-called Mandelstam plane. So in Mandelstam plane, we just draw, uh, say, S and T. Uh, you see that we have a, for physical scattering, we have a minimal energy, which is a 4m squared. It's 4m squared. Then we have a 4m squared for T, and then we can draw this line. So for this, uh, you see that as, as uh, theta changes from, say, 0 to pi, t takes, uh, t takes, goes from 0 to minimal value. And so if you consider physical scattering, it looks like this object, if you just, uh, we start with the physical scattering, this object is defined in some uh, regions of the Mandelstam plane. which actually describe different channels, so different channels of scattering. For example, if you scatter particles 1, 2 into 3, 4, then S is larger than 4 squared, so it's there. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4. Here you have 1, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 4, 2, 3. And of course, uh, if we consider identical particles, this function is uh, completely symmetric, and so we have a crossing, which is states T S T T T S equal T U T. So at the moment we we st identical scalar yeah identical scalars identical scalars. Um, so at the moment we have this uh, objects defined for uh, real S and real T, but one of the first beautiful fact about the uh, S matrix is that which people understood again in the 60s and uh, um, my understanding that the, the way they thought about it is you start with Q of T, you have uh, locality and you have causality and you have uh, what is known temperedness, which is essentially related to polynomial boundedness. And then you do LSZ reduction, and you end up with this amplitude. And uh, Can you the statement about polynomial boundedness? Yeah, so usually um, there is, I think, a part of uh, Whiteman axioms is what's known as temperedness, which is essentially that they're polynomially bounded or Fourier transform exists. It's, so the, yeah, so the polynomial boundedness of uh, Whiteman function is basically that uh, this, there is this operator value distribution. So if you integrate operators with Schwartz functions, these things exist. And then through this, I think, uh, the work of this Epstein, uh, Epstein, Glaser, and Bross, they basically use this fact, an LSE reduction, to show that uh, T as T is polynomially bounded. For fixed T, for fixed T, yeah, for fixed T, and uh, uh, it's it's uh, bounded in the S plane, and also the use. So you start with the QFT, you have a commutator, which is zero at space-like separations, and so this is led to the fact that the when you do again the LSE reduction, this there is a you can show that there is a, this result of uh, Epstein, Glaser, and Bross is a is that this function is actually a boundary value of analytic function. So the scattering, uh, scattering amplitude that we will be, let me write it, so scattering is described by a boundary value of analytic function, and this is, uh, and th this is also sometimes known. Uh, this is sometimes known as a, 
uh, I-epsilon prescription, namely the, the, the physical scattering. Okay, I will now reply to you. Let me just finish formula and then I will, because it will take some time. Uh, so everything is okay with this thing? No? Um, shall I continue or? Okay. Now, regarding Frasar bound, so how do you derive a Frasar bound? Um, so the way. Uh, sorry, Sasha, this is Mumbai. Oh. Uh, connection for a minute or two. Uh, I. I couldn't hear what you said, the scattering amplitude analytic. Is there a proof that there is an analytic or an assumption? No. Yeah, so the, okay, as you, as you all know, this, the issue of analyticity, it's, it's a very uh, big topic in it, so if, let me be very precise. And first, I think there was a statement that uh, if you fix T, so first it started as you fixed, that's what these guys actually prove. That if you take a physical t, so t less than zero and less than t larger than some t1, then the amplitude admits uh, dispersion relations in S, with the only singularities being in S, uh, being the physical cuts. So that's what, what they prove. And then there is a famous work by Martin about extension of analyticity domain, where he showed that by unitarity essentially we can uh, extend this region of analyticity from t less than zero to t equal to four m squared. So, and then uh, unitarity, actually. He used, uh, he essentially used properties of Legendre polynomials. So that was uh, really something, the, the heart of his proof. So then uh, uh, there is a region in t plane uh, for which uh, we know analyticity in S but, uh, and this, this is a proven thing. Moreover, so coming back to Frost R bound, so if you, have a, if you have dispersion relations in S with N subtractions, which is uh, what these guys prove, and then you use uh, Martin techniques, you can show that in any QFT for physical T, you, you, you have at most two subtractions. So this is uh, another famous result from this era. Now, uh, if you want, if you ask me, uh, the, the, the next thing I was going to, to quote, and uh, this is what is done in the numerics also, there is something which is known as a maximal analyticity. Maximal analyticity is a statement that all singularities that scattering amplitudes have are the only minimal set of singularities which are required by unitarities. This was never... Yeah. Okay, maybe I should go through it. Um, actually, I was going to talk about it. Uh, anyway, so uh, I would say that there is an established analyticity domain of the scattering amplitude, which involves uh, what is known as a, a Lehman-Martin ellipse, ellipse uh, which, which is analyticity in S for T in some subregion of T plane. Beyond that, it is an assumption. For example, the famous formula, which is known as the Mandelstam representation, which assumes not only maximal analyticity, which is that, well, I will discuss it now, that the set of singularities is the only minimal mode. It was never proven. But it also, on top of that, assumes polynomial unboundedness of discontinuity. This was never proven again. So what I've proven is a polynomial boundedness of the amplitude itself. To establish Mandelstam representation, you need uh, maximal analyticity and polynomial boundedness of the discontinuities. This was not proven. So I would say that for most, for, for all the theorems basically that are in the books, uh, for example, for Frost R bound, uh, what you need is analyticity as, 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 as is known as a, a Lemon Martin ellipse, which I will discuss. Uh, sorry, one. Oh. Sorry. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, well, sorry, one more. Um, uh, do these do these proofs uh, and assumptions depend on the theory having a mass gap? Does things do things go become more complicated when there are massless particles? Yes, all this long range proof, forces. Uh, all these proofs are based on uh, Whiteman axioms or versions of thereof, like HAG, local, whatever formulations of QFT, and they assume uh, mass gap. Uh, which of the results? Uh, which of the results of this whole program can be uh, uh, translated into gravitational theory? I think it's a very interesting question, and uh, I don't know the answer. For example, uh, the, regarding analytic structure of uh, scattering amplitudes, uh, there was this program. So there was a program of deriving everything from Whiteman ax axioms, and this is a story of Martin Lemon ellipse. But there is also there was a separate program of just uh, doing axiomatic as metrics, and they have uh, their own arguments to, to establish some analytic, analytic properties based on what is known as <laughs> macro causality, which again assumes uh, mass gap. But clearly, even gravitational theories, we have some notions of asymptotic causality. And we know that in string theory, the amplitude has nice analytic properties. So presumably, in, a, uh, in gravitational theories, uh, some of these claims are also true. In I think in string theory, uh, yeah. non string theory amplitudes violate what is known. Uh, well, it violates, uh, yeah. It, uh, you mean this uh, Cerulus Martin bound that decays too fast? Or, yeah, or? Uh, decaying, of course, decays faster than any Q theory, but right. doesn't, uh, doesn't violate any of the statements there. So, yes, uh, well, it's. Uh, right. Right, right, right. It, uh, well, uh, I think, uh, I guess, something which is, uh, for example, I, I find very interesting and it's related to the, my third talk, which is that is there, is there uh, an analog of the statement that in every QFT we, for physical T or T less than 4 m square, two subtractions is enough. What is the analog in gravity? How many subtractions? And say uh, again from from our work on this asymptotic causality, it looks like, again, the amplitude should not grow faster than a squared. And then when you go to ads CFT and you look at the correlators, there is definitely an analog of that. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. I would like to understand it, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. So uh, all these proofs based on Whiteman axioms, but presumably some of them could be restated in terms of asymptotic causality and say, because if you if we think of gravity at the far region as roughly as a QFT, and we have commutators, which are zero, and uh, this essentially this leads to this analyticity. But the the papers, of course, they they all just assume mass gap. You said the analyticity follows even if the commutator is a zero. The I think so. No, that was never been shown. But uh, as I said, so there is this program of asymptotic, whatever, axiomatic S metrics, which do not talk about commutators. And so, and they managed to derive something. Uh, and uh, I mean, if we, if we think of uh, gravity, say, in flat space as a graviton, as just a quantum field far away, made of A daggers and A and cylinder being the causal structure, which is, uh, which is respected by whatever we collide in the middle. If we go far away, things should, like an idea CFT, the causal structure at infinity should be respected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we do the same in flat space. But, but generally, doesn't all of this assume that there's some causal micro causality which holds everywhere in the bulk? This? Yes. yes, this uh, yeah, this is QFT. This is QFT. Yes, yes. Here it's all uh, local QFTs. There are operators. There is a LZ reduction and uh, uh, what I'm doing. But again, I think there are there is this whole program of axiomatic asymmetrics which which do not rely on that and try to use some other notions uh, to derive that. But I don't know very much about that. Is this the right thing? Again, repeat this question about polynomial boundedness versus... Please, yes, let's, so, um, I guess so the, the question, uh, the, the precise statement that I think this uh, Bross, Epstein, and Glaser proven from which everything else, including for us, are bound follows, is that you can write for physical T, you can write dispersion relations in S with N subtractions. 
Yeah, and this, uh, the claim, it follows from Whiteman axioms. So that's, and then the way it works, so the, actually the, the um, so I will, I will digress a little bit, but maybe it's good. We have to discuss this thing. So the way it works is that you, you uh, start with this subtractions with n subtractions, but then if you use unitarity and you write it in terms of Legendre polynomials in the partial waves, and you use the fact that analytic structure of amplitude is such that the amplitude um, has to be analytic. Uh, so when, when S is below 4M square or T is below 4M square, so the physical region here is T is negative. So what Martin exploited is that even if you start continuing T to be positive, but below N squared, it has to stay analytic. And if you combine it with partial waves, then you show that first Ross are bound, and then from Ross are bound, you show that uh, for t less than 4 n square, here you can you can write dispersion relations with just two subtractions, with two subtractions at most. So um, this is this kind of classic results from the 60s that uh, they did. The polynomial boundary is the fact that uh, it goes slower than n to the power n or whatever. Yeah. That n does not enter the uh, actual coefficient of the process. Uh, no, it's I, well. It, 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 I think it. Sorry, it does. I think, but uh, but uh, but the bound. That's, so the, the coefficient itself. Right, the coefficient itself is. Uh, I think the, the argument first maybe it enters, but this is, is if you if you prove the Frosser bound, you can use it then to write dispersion relations with two subtractions. So in the end, you're dealing with uh, dispersion relations with two subtractions. And uh, and you can one actually one fact which also is very well known to in the S matrix apparently community but I've never seen it written in the books that frost are bound usually is written as a local bound that total cross section could not grow larger than log s square it's actually not the correct way to state the bound because if you are being careful about it the frost are bound is only true on average as in the conformal bootstraps there was usually recently the Stoberian theorems. So the Frasar bound is a local if Frasar bound can be violated. But it's only true on average. And, uh, I have a question. Yeah. So I was going to ask about the, uh, this type of uh, results that you derive by analysis. Yeah. Did I have any underlying green theory with a gap, let's say, let's say five root theory? Right. So what, uh, what is, is being assumed is Whiteman axioms. Yes, but five root theory I know is not very good in real trial. Okay. Uh, I don't know. My guess would be that analytic properties and growth should be different, but. Uh, but it's such an exotic thing, I would say. So even if I assume Whiteman axioms, uh, we don't. I mean, yes. Well, with Whiteman axioms, we are on safer grounds. If we relax those, I don't know what happens. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I don't know. I'm not sure what is the what is the theory which does not satisfy Whiteman axioms. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> That yeah, yeah. That doesn't yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, you know you can't really define these correlators as uh, things which are uh, you know. Uh, so uh, is it, doesn't that mean that if you, I mean, this problem that's been done, you call the presumed data. That's the way that I understand. Ultraviolet completion is a much probably a strongest. Uh, these correlators are not well defined. These Euclidean correlators are uh, uh, correct. I don't know, but. Uh, I mean, if you, if, you, if you really try to define these exact correlators in the positive, the presumably they do not exist. Uh, yeah. Presumably, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, okay. So um, um, we have this. Now we have this. Uh, the whole the whole plane is connected by one ana one analytic function, which has a set of uh, singularities, which are uh, so which which we can figure out by by writing this condition in terms of t. Let me write this famous formula also. So 
that's equal to T dagger, and this is known optical theorem. And so from uh, from this thing, uh, you immediately see that uh, here, as you increase the energy, so if we again, if we sandwich this statement uh, for external states, we get that imaginary part of the amplitude is equal to sum over all states in the middle. And so this, uh, to, to open up the channel with, say, n particles, you need energy which is larger than a correspondent one. And so this is a, this has a so-called normal thresholds. which open up when s is larger than n times m, where n is the number of particles. So this is a minimal set of singularities dictated by unitarity. Another property of the, uh, of the, uh, of this amplitude is known as a Hermitian elasticity. which is, uh, if you wish, uh, Unit is a unitarity below any threshold channel is open, so it's stating that when you are here, the amplitude is real. And from this, so you can then analytically continue. As usual, there is unique analytic continuation as a statement that, that when you... Uh, so here is the usual statement that for the physical amplitude, we to read off the physical amplitude, we should learn above the cut. Hermitian analyticity tells you that if you if you uh, if you land if you land below the cut, then you dis you describe the scatter the conjugate scattering. Basically, that's why from here you get the imaginary part of the amplitude because the imaginary part of the amplitude is the difference of the amplitude here and here, and the amplitude here is controlled the physical process, and the amplitude here is controlled the dagger process, which is a statement of Hermitian analyticity. No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Right, right. So yes, it's real. It's real for s below the cut, and then you analytically continue. Exactly. Um, now uh, there is in in this in uh, so this is uh, rigorous stuff. Sometimes it's uh, after all the examples and. Uh, Based on experience, people make a stronger assumption. For example, in this numerical work, which we can think of as a something we would like to understand or something, some recent development, in this numerical work, they assume what is known as a maximal analyticity. So this is an assumption. And that states that uh, all singularities is just minimal set, minimal set of singularities required required by unitarity. Um, but their image under crossing, their images under crossing. So in this case, uh, what is the set of singularities? Well, said we have, let's draw an S-plane. So at 4M squared, we have a threshold, first threshold. Then there are 9M squared, next threshold, at, uh, and uh, n particle thresholds. And under crossing, if we have u equal 4m square or s equal minus t, we have a we have a second cut. So in the maximal analyticity, you assume that the amplitude is analytic in the product of two complex planes for s and for t with this kind of cuts. This is an assumption. What about poles? Yes, in principle, you can have poles here. 
Uh, I assume, actually, that would be for convenience, I assume that I have some, say, Z2 symmetry, so that the pole does not appear, but you can have poles. So, For me, I, have, uh, I will consider theory with a stable, single stable scalar pseudoparticle, such that the particle itself does not appear here. So. Either you have I think it just follows from unitarity again, isn't it? Because if we have a single pole, we will have a correct, uh, uh, we will have a correct unitarity condition. So for the so here, well, that's not quite true because you're saying that we cannot. Uh, it's it's below. There was a question, question poles at the beginning of the transcript. Why, why are these simple poles and not quantum poles? Sorry, there's one pole at the at four m squared. No, no, it's not the pole. It's a cut. At the start of the branch cut, you could have a pole. I mean, it could be singularity at the start. Actually, uh, it's a, it's not a. In general, you cannot have a pole there. Well, it depends what you want to assume. If you want, to, if you assume that you have a new particle with exactly this mass, you can have a pole everywhere. But if you assume there is a one stable particle, the be, the behavior here is very interesting. I, 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 will, I, I was going to discuss, it's actually go exactly against what the intuition you get from perturbation theories. For example, instead of log, you get one over log, non-perturbatively, but we will discuss that. I think regarding poles, let, let me think about it. I, I, I haven't thought about it. I would imagine that there should be, um, there should be an argument along, along these lines, at least uh, Usually, when we have poles, the way we fix the structure of the poles is by imposing uh, this generalized unitarity, focusing on the poles, I would imagine. Uh, this uh, is, sorry, sorry. Yeah. This of uh, uh, maximum analysis, can it, let's say, in a simple theory, in theory, Feynman diagram, the singularity diagrams are these? Yeah, I think it's. It's what you get in perturbation theory. So it's proved that there are no other things other than these physical ones uh, at the nth order in a Feynman diagram. In, in perturbation, I think in perturbation theory for scattering of equal masses, it is true. Okay. If you consider unequal masses, then there are anomalous thresholds, and the story is much more, is more complicated. So this is yes, this is consistent with perturbation theory, and. Uh, um, yeah. Now let me. Okay, so from here you see that uh, the uh, here we formulated everything uh, that is. Uh, how do I erase? Oh, okay. So uh, at this point you you are ready to. Formulate uh, ah, and a little oh, sorry, one one little more comment. So, what about Mandelstam representation? So, in Mandelstam representation, you essentially you write double dispersion relation. So you write one dispersion integral, and then you write a second dispersion integral. But to write a second dispersion integral. Um, you have to assume polynomial boundedness of the first discontinuity, which has not been proven. I don't know if I, is it clear dispersion integral? I I hope it's it's a just Cauchy theorem. Shall, Maybe can you just say what Mandelstam? Okay. Yes. Sorry. So. Um, so Mandelstam representation is a formula of this type that you write an amplitude um, of STU. As a sum of say three terms, uh, something like this, and then you write for a s and t double dispersion integral with some spectral density. So it's a sort of double Cauchy theorem. And here, where you usually put 4m square, we will discuss why. And uh, the way you can derive it, as I told you, you, you have a polynomial boundedness. So you, this is proven. So if you have as of t, you can write something like 
ds prime disk s a s prime t s prime minus s. So this is proven. Uh, but then to go from here to here, you want to do the second discontinue second dispersion relation. This is not this not been proven. Uh, it might be, but it's it's so we have proven this for we have proven this for say for uh, fixed t, and now we would like to. Oh, you want to yeah, we 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 can extend for t. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So in particular. Um, yeah, I think if, if, we, if we take Veneziano amplitude, it behaves as S to the T. So there is no uh, uni uniform bound. We can always violate it. I think that was, uh, yeah. So now, uh, so if we, if we impose uh, unitarity, we want to impose uh, crossing, and we can assume if we want uh, maximal analyticity, So let's say we want to find a space of S matrices that satisfy that. Now, uh, people obviously tried that, and uh, uh, there are there are bounds like in a conformal bootstrap. There are bounds on the. For example, people like to bound in this business. So here there is a crossing symmetric point when s equal t equal u is 4m square over 3. So people were exploring bounds on this point and um, they derived them. Uh, moreover, they constructed, the, uh, they constructed test functions which satisfy all these principles. And uh, therefore, whatever bound you derive is better satisfied. But one thing that no one ever managed to do in this S matrix bootstrap, well, there was, only, I think, one success, successful example of this. But one thing that people uh, in general don't understand how to impose is elastic unitarity. Um, and I will explain what it is. And in particular, if uh, in the numerical work of, um, that I mentioned, elastic unitarity is not imposed either. <coughs> so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open problem in the subject how to deal with elastic unitarity. And I will tell you now, so this is something which does not appear in conformal bootstrap. So what is elastic unitarity? Let me, let me say what it is. So elastic unitarity in the simplest statement that if I have a scattering of uh, the pseudo scalar particles, then um, if I look at the S plane, there is 4m squared. And then the next open channel is 3 is uh, excluded by parity is n equal 4, so it's 16m squared. So therefore, in the region of S between 16 and 4 m squared, you have the only amplitude that is allowed here is again 2 to 2 amplitude. So we have fully non-perturbative equation for amplitude itself. That imagine now, imaginally part of the amplitude is equal integral over phase space of the amplitude square, if you wish. This is elastic unitarity. This is, and you see that here we use essentially this fact. We, here we use essentially this fact that we have a gap and we have a hierarchy of scales. Why? So this condition people are struggling to impose because in a sense, unitarity and analyticity are linear conditions. But this is a nonlinear condition. You have a square, an imaginary part, and there is no efficient method numerically or analytically to solve it. 
Now, why is this important? Well, let me go to the uh, theorems which I wanted to prove. So first, let me formulate Ax theorem. Um, one thing uh, you might wonder is that I try to be careful in saying that we do know we do not know exact S matrices in dimension higher than two, because in two dimensions we have integrable S matrices, and they are characterized by the fact that there is no C particle production. So you might you might have asked, can we construct a scattering amplitude in high, dimensions higher than two, which has scattering but does not have production? In principle, why not? Right? You have two to two, which is a pure phase. It satisfies this thing. And so Ax theorem says that scattering implies production in D larger than 2. So it's not possible. That's the result of the theorem. And uh, the proof of the theorem is very, very neat. So I was going to, uh, to go through it. Any questions about that? So D is space time. Space time, yeah. So in D equal 2, there are integrable theories. In D larger than 2, it's not allowed. You cannot do that. Sorry, just if you look at large n vectors and you look to the large n, you are capturing without production. Okay. As an extent, it's not true. Uh, what you're saying is true. Uh, sorry, say again. Consider the Wilson theory. Right. And consider the S matrix on uh, that cloud production. I don't hear anything. <laughs> forget it, forget it, go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine at N. Oh, it's important that it's all quantum. I, I, I'm not sure. If, if something is possible in large N, it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, uh, here the claim is about the full quantum S matrix. Um, I was asking, like, yeah. M is the smallest you consider? Like, yeah, 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 it's the lightest, so we have only, I consider a theory with a one light particle, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So, when you say scattering implies production, uh, uh, so for this range, so the theorem is that it's only some phase? Uh, yeah, so imagine that you want to, to consider a theory where this is true for all S. So essentially, S matrix is pure phase. A priori, it looks fine. Let me tell you even something more than that. If you look at, if you read the paper by, uh, by Joao and Joao Penedonis and Pedro Vieira and friends, they, they maximize the amplitude here in four dimensions. And uh, if you look not carefully at what they get, they seem to be getting, they seem to be landing on an amplitude which looks exactly like this, like scattering without production. So it's, uh, so it's connected actually to their work and we, in, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the end they do have production, but it looks like they almost, it's almost purely elastic. And uh, we will develop in this direction. So let me, it's uh, crazy, it's already 12. <laughs> um, yes, I'm far behind. Yeah. What do the letters AKS stand for? Sorry? AKS. AKS is the last name of a person. <laughs> <laughs> it's Stanley Axe. He, he, he wrote the paper in 1964. Um, okay, let me, uh, let me, how much time can I take? Five, 10 minutes? Okay. I'll, Sorry, um, but we have a, a lot of discussion, so it's good. Uh, let me just uh, show you the proof of this theorem because it's very beautiful. And it starts from the result of Mandelstam, uh, from a uh, result of Mandelstam that he, he wrote his f famous paper which where he introduced Mandelstam representation and in 58. The, the way it goes is let me rewrite, let me write this condition. 
So it's imaginary part, this stands, this TS stands for discontinuity, is equal to K, where K is the momentum in the center of mass frame. Um, and here we have an integral over phase space, over all the states, and we have a, some conjugate amplitude as t prime and t as t double prime. So again, uh, we are taking this amplitude and we are cutting it in between and sum over all states. Is this what it means? Now, uh, let's do the following thing. Uh, the idea would be to analytically continue this relation in T. So this is, a, this is a physical integral for physical angles. And the idea is that it admits an analytic continuation. And the way you do it is the following. You, let's, take, uh, let's take this um, amplitude. And uh, as we discuss, there is an extended analyticity in T. Maximal, maximal analyticity is not needed. We will use this Martin analyticity, which is such that we have analyticity beyond this physical region in T. And the way you just you do it is you rewrite this amplitude as a Cauchy, Cauchy integral. Um, so z is a cosine of the scattering angle, which we integrate, so it goes between minus 1 and 1. And uh, we take this integral to be around minus 1 and 1, and use analyticity of the amplitude in T in this martin lehmann ellipse, which is essentially tells you that it's, it, you can do that. Um, let me write it that z is equal to cosine theta equal 1 plus 2t over s minus 4 n squared. In particular, so as we discussed, that you have a threshold when t equal 4 n squared. So if you plug here t equal 4 n squared, you get z equal 1 plus 8 n squared over s squared minus 4 n squared. And this is, uh, let me call it a1s, is 1 plus Eight m squared over s minus four m squared, and here you have an image of this minus one s. So this is just normal thresholds in T channel. But so far we are just here. So you 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 take uh, you you take this this amplitude, you write it as a Cauchy integral, and you plug it back here. Then you see that all dependence on this z prime, this angle of integration, is through this denominator. So you can fully do this integral, and uh, you get, as a result, the following expression. Uh, the expression is, uh, is just this. Ts, s and z is equal. Um, there are some factors. numbers, let me ignore them, and then we have these two integrals. And uh, we have T star S and prime, T S and double prime, and we have a kernel where the kernel is equal to the integral over this uh, over angles one over eta prime minus z prime one over eta double time. So this is a completely kinematical kernel. You can just compute it one and for all in any number of dimensions. And these are best discontinuity. Yeah, it's discontinuity yes. So in four dimensions, in particular, you can show that the kernel is given by 4 pi integral over 
eta from eta plus to infinity g eta eta minus z and here you get one root um, eta minus eta minus eta plus where eta minus i equal eta. Uh, I will explain in a, in a second what, what this means. So, okay, this is just a result of a computation. You can do that and you can check that it's correct. Now, what is the meaning of, uh, of this uh, thing? This is uh, what is known as a large lemon ellipse. So, as I briefly told you that uh, in property of Legendre polynomials and an OLTCT of the amplitude implies that in this uh, cosine, so in this cosine variable, sorry. What, what ellipse can you like to mean? Lehman. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. So there is Lehman ellipse and there is a large Lehman ellipse. So large Lehman ellipse is a statement about uh, discontinuity. And the Lehman is a statement about the amplitude itself. So, what we got here is exactly is a, so uh, is this large Lehman ellipse because if you take a eta prime and eta two eta double prime to be on some uh, ellipse, so if you take eta prime to be cosh alpha prime plus i mu. I'm, so as mu goes from 0 to 2 pi, it describes an ellipse. <laughs> Alpha double prime plus I and double prime. Then uh, eta plus minus is nothing but, so I would be, uh, would be relevant for us is eta plus. Then eta plus is nothing but Okay, so the idea is uh, now we have this representation. We would like to uh, continue the discontinuity in Z. So we'd like to increase Z. As Z increases, uh, as Z increases, say we have Z somewhere here. So we started from Z here and we move it somewhere. As Z increases, you hit the contour. So to avoid the singularity, you extend the contour. And therefore, the amplitude is completely analytic. And you would like to ask, okay, when does it end? Imagine you continue z to here. Then you can deform the amplitude, but then you have a pinch. You cannot continue it anymore. Uh, so if you can either continue here or continue here. This is a different path, and they will lead to a different answer. And therefore, you can, take, uh, you can use this formula not only to analytically continue, but to compute the double discontinuity of this object using this representation. And uh, if you do that, you see that the double discontinuity, if uh, the first, if you wish, the first discontinuity starts at A1, which is just t equal to 4n squared, then, uh, so if we say that A1 of s is equal to cosh alpha, then the, the discontinuity of uh, the, the double discontinuity Start at uh, two alpha, which is equal to two a one square s minus one. Again, so this is a uh, sorry, it was not very clear, maybe, but the idea is very simple. You start with analytic elastic unitarity. You do this thing. You uh, you plug uh, the Cauchy integral, compute the kernel, and try to analytically continue. And then you get the pinch, so that you can read off the pinch, and you you find that in that, yes, continue in that. And you're trying to land up either on top of the cut. Yeah, you you try to see where does it develop double discontinuity. Then you see that it develops it here. And if you look as uh, the relevant, the relevant, the relevant. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the whole equation. So now we. 
continue everything here in, in, in Z, but you see that Z only here, so and it's, it's, it's tied to eta plus, and eta plus is this larger ellipse. So when, when Z is become equal to eta plus, at this um, larger ellipse, when both eta prime and eta double prime hit this cut, you see that you develop the double discontinuity. So that's um, the that's idea. And, and you get this, uh, if, you, if you do this uh, exercise, you get this questions of Mandelstam. That's the double discontinuity in T and in S is equal to integral along the cuts. Get the integral. So uh, now we deform the contour so that it lands along the cut. And uh, here, what we get is discontinuity in Z of the kernel. And as you see, because uh, the dependence on Z is just through the pole, the discontinuity takes a delta function. Delta function has only support when uh, only when that is uh, R than eta plus. And here, this is a four-dimensional answer. So this is a analytically continued elastic unitarity condition. And you see that when eta prime and eta double prime take their minimal value, then eta plus is equal to 2a in square minus s. Now, this, is, uh, this condition is, this theta function is known as a Karplus curve, or Landau curve sometimes. What does it mean? It means sometimes you might, sorry. Sorry, so now, uh, so, thank you. So, you see, we start, have, we have this contour integral. I have to specify what it is. So now here I wrote, if I take eta prime and eta double prime on ellipse, okay. then in the eta plus variable, the figures that you get is ellipse of twice the size. So if you, if you do this integral of eta plus like this, and then eta plus like this, you, you can ask, what, is, what do you get for eta, eta plus? And you just get uh, twice the size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is just a parameterization of eta prime. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Um, now uh, you can ask, what is this condition? What is this condition in terms of uh, T and S? And uh, in terms of uh, T and S, the condition is. Uh, is uh, the following. So um, z should be larger than 2a1 square minus 1. And you can check that this is, uh, uh, and recall z is 1 plus 2t over s minus 4 n squared. This becomes the t larger than 16m squared plus 64m to the fourth s minus 4m squared. So this is known as a leading Landau curve. And if you go back to the Mandelstam plane, remember we start S and T. Uh, we have this physical region, S equal 4m squared, T equal 4m squared. The physical region was, oh, sorry, this was not a good drawing. I want it to be much closer, so let's say it's 4m squared here. And here, 16m squared. And we have elastic unitarity here for sure. And if there is no production everywhere. And what we just proven is that, OK, you have a physical scattering here. So you have a first discontinuity supported here and here. 
But if you look at this condition, you see when s go to 4m squared, t goes to infinity. So it's like this. And when s go to infinity, t goes to 16m squared. Um, so you have here this kind of curve. that asymptotes to infinity at 4 and to 16 at infinity. And the statement is a double spectral density is just supported here. This is a kinematical fact. And here there also you have the crossing, crossing maps of this. I have to. Sorry. I think it's better to be my slower. I'm happy to be slower, but I am. Still, uh, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, okay, that's a, that's an important fact to have in mind that we just started from elastic unitarity and we derived the region of support of a double spectral function. And uh, now the argument of X goes as follows. So let me introduce. Sorry, this alpha was also a defining. It's defining. It's defining in terms of beta plus. The yeah, so it's 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 a it's a, if you if you consider the contour which starts here at cosh alpha prime, this is this is the alpha in the a one of s in the fourth line. In the fourth line, yes, that's that's a, yes. So um, this was a quantum leap here. <laughs> so if. Uh, if we now uh, extend the uh, if we now extend the ellipse, yeah. then when we extend it to this size, we start developing a double disk. So, so the, the amplitude develops uh, this singularity. So essentially, I'm not doing anything uh, uh, complicated. Try to compute yes, use this formula and try to compute the double discontinuity of this guy by continuing in z. And the claim is that what you get. Is uh, this formula? I'm asking is the eta plus became a one of s. The limit here is the integral was eta plus, right? Yeah. Lower limit in the eta. Yeah, integral. yeah. So eta plus is a one of s. Eta plus is a one of s. Well, eta plus if if uh, if eta prime and eta double prime is equal to a1, then eta plus is equal to a1 square minus 1. That's the maximum. Uh, Just plug it here, if you plug it here. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, so if we assume no production, then from elastic unitarity, we just derived that that if we take the uh, double density, um, we 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 got that double spectral density is zero for s and uh, t less than sixteen and squared plus 64 m to the 4 is minus 4 m squared. That's what we derived. Uh, now the idea of uh, X is to apply crossing to the statement. So if you compute, if we have an amplitude which is uh, analytic in this S and T complex of S and T, you can write a double discontinuity as a sum of, of the amplitudes approaching different cuts, and you see that it's crossing symmetric. So therefore, you want to you want to have R S and T equal to R T and S, and from this it follows. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry. No production means that no production means that I do not put here an upper value. If there is production, I cannot apply this equation. So that's a key. Key thing, and uh, it will be now clear on the on the on the picture. 
Um, so if we if we plot. Yeah. Uh, th that's just a definition, I would say. Yeah, it's. It doesn't use the Mandelstam. No, 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 no. It doesn't. It doesn't. We never use Mandelstam. It's. We don't need Mandelstam representation for that. So what we got is uh, that normally, in a normal theory, between four and sixteen, we got that the the support of the uh, of the spectral function should be just here, so somewhere here, and everywhere else it should be zero. But now let's let's draw, and if there is no production, this curve continues forever. And now let's flip this curve. So we do the crossing transform. Then for t larger than four n squared, and for s less than. 16m squared plus 64m to the 4 t minus 4m squared, the spectral density should be also zero. This is just a crossing transform of this statement. So you see that here, when t goes to 4m squared, s goes to infinity. So it starts like here. And uh, when, uh, and say when t goes to infinity, s goes to 16m squared. So this is a crossing picture. Now, if, if, there is no, if there is a particle production, we just have this picture in this strip and in this strip. So we cannot do much. In particular, we cannot apply this bound outside of the strip. But if you have a no particle production, it's true for any t. In particular, it goes here. And therefore, you see that the double spectrum density should be 0 here in this region. So uh, again, the, the, the idea is that so from the first channel, we get that the spectral density is below zero below this curve. But from the crossed spectral density, we got it should be zero below this curve. So from the crossing channel, we got a stronger bound. We got a stronger bound here. If you wish, if you combine, if you combine the both channels, the region where the spectral density has support, is only here. So this is crossing. Is that clear? Now let's write the condition that the spectral density is zero here. We get this equation, zero equal, roughly, t squared. And uh, you can Plug, it's, it's shown, it was, uh, I guess, explained by Mao and Martin, but it's uh, essentially follows just property of Legendre polynomials. So we have uh, here TT. And if you plug for the discontinuity here, sum of Legendre polynomials, and you use unitarity, you get that if the scattering is present, this is positive definite. And therefore, you get a contradiction. So again, uh, we started from elastic unitarity. We derive the support of spectral density. We analytically continue elastic unitarity, derive support of spectral density. Then we used crossing. And then we used unitarity again to show that this implies that t equals 0. So this is a... Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the claim is that uh, it will be probably more clear when I introduce um, when I introduce uh, partial waves or something, but so we got that 0 is equal to this integral, which is this equation. And now, uh, if we have scattering, it means that we have some non-zero T. T is non-zero, right? That's what is the definition of scattering. Then you can use uh, elastic unitarity to write TT 
as an integral of t squared in some region, right? And this in, in, in the scattering would imply that tt is equal to, is positive. That's in some region. It's just a statement, say, of elastic unitarity. Now you plug this formula here in this sort of continuum elastic unitarity, and you get that this guy in this region is positive definite. And therefore, you get a contradiction. If you have a production, then you do not have this argument because uh, the original condition applies here, and this origin and the dual condition applies here. So it was crucial to continue it above to get a to get a contradiction. You're applying the condition at a point where the discontinuity is one. Uh, where, um, where did it become? What happened to the discontinuity of k? Uh, here? Yes. And nothing, it's, it's, it's written here. Uh, what happened to the discontinuity of k? The discontinuity of yeah. this? Yeah, the, kernel, the kernel is present. So uh, the kernel is present. You, you, the point is that, uh, yes, it's important point. The, if you look at the region of this integral, the, the kernel is positive definite. Sorry, the kernel is positive definite. The kernel is positive definite and the, uh, the t itself is positive definite. And therefore, you get that unitarity implies that double spectral density should be not equal to zero. So, in this way, you, and of course, all these arguments you cannot do it in two dimensions, for obvious reasons. Yeah, so, um, but it's a neat, uh, neat argument. And uh, similarly, by using the, so by using this formula, you can prove what is known as Grebov's theorem. Um, okay, let me stop here. Sorry. I will continue next time. I think it's roughly that, um, well, I think it's roughly something like this. Um, let's say we start. We start with uh, this picture, which implies that the amplitude develops imaginary part. And you can cut it. Then, uh, as you increase t, you would think that you should be able to draw a picture like that also. <laughs> which is... Uh, um, let's see, how do we do this? So we want to do this. This is a statement that the amplitude developed a double spectral density because we now have a two-particle state. And so the, the, the building block is always the same starting building block, which is this. But what, what unitarity tells us is that we can glue it. And, uh, and we see that if we, if we develop this singularity, as we cut it once and we continue in T, we start developing this singularity. But you see that this, um, somehow this is nothing but a 2 to 4 amplitude. So, well, I'm not sure if it helps, but I think this is, uh, this is the interpretation of this, of this Landau curve or Carpus curve of, of this region. And, uh, but then the fact that crossing, somehow crossing forces you, um, to have the zero amplitude, um, yeah, crossing forces you to have this non-zero. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So, yes. When you have production because of the, when you have production because of the uh, reason that you said in the curves there will be no overlap in the yeah. double spectral function, so the final expression will be satisfied and uh, there will be no violation, right? Yeah, that's, that's idea. The, that's idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, this equation is correct, but this equation is correct, but there is an extra contribution from say two to four, which we have to add here. Yes, 
sorry maybe maybe i'm just repeating what you just said just to make sure i understand yeah. the statement is that when you have a particle production you get this diagram the uh, the the lower diagram that you have drawn yeah and uh, and uh, because it is allowed when there is a particle production yeah in this regime and that gives you a, a double uh, d- a contribution to the double spectral function yeah. and hence it it, uh, it prevents this theorem from being uh, active is that is that the right right argument? right so if you have if you have if you have uh, so if you try to prohibit this thing mm. you somehow run into trouble with unitarity and crossing uh, the, the idea is that so here we enforced we enforced that there is no 2 to 4 but, uh, but just uh, the so we started from this diagram and then we analytically continue it and we found that uh, we develop a double double the spectral uh, density, which um, yeah I think I'm just repeating myself. I so yeah I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. maybe can I ask you the other question, which is that so you had drawn these two images. There's yeah. a one curve. Yeah. And then there is a crossing image of that. Yeah, the crossing image of that would be the this thing rotated in the S channel. Uh, yes. So I, I, uh, if I, let's see. So we, it, it should be right. So it's the reflection about the line S equals B. Right. 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 The forty-five degree line. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that would be the this kind of a diagram rotated. Is that? Uh, well, I think you you reflect it along this line, and so uh, this guy goes here, and this guy goes there, and um, and you get yes, and you you, you get this curve uh, rotating around. I'm not sure if uh, you can rotate it around which yeah around which axis. It's rather a flip, I would say, and I think it's uh, it should be clear from this formula. I don't know if it's visible, but so we started with a condition that the density is zero for t less than this curve, and then you just do the flip, and you see that in particular these two asymptotics are crossing symmetric to each other. When s goes to four, t goes to infinity. When t goes to four, s goes to infinity. When s goes to infinity, t to goes. When t goes to infinity, s goes to sixteen. Okay. And then you just draw this curve, and so. The optical theorem would, would apply even for non-relativistic theory, and then presumably you could have scattering without production. But it's the fact that you have crossing which forces you to have uh, production, right? That's well. Is relativistic, but you know the the, the diagram on top would still be true in non-relativistic theory. There would be a diagram of the kind above. There would be right. There's no STU, and it's true, but that but that diagram is just a statement about uh, you know uh, two to two scattering and unitarity. So that that would still be true, uh, but but it wouldn't imply the existence maybe of a diagram. Uh, I mean, I, I see you've put in relativistic invariance from yeah, the yeah, get go. Yeah. I, it's it's yeah, inbuilt. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just wanted to isolate where it's right. uh, where it's important. Uh, into proving this theorem because this theorem would presumably not hold in a non-relativistic theory. Yeah. And I, I mean, there's it's built into the whole STU form, but yeah. If you have massless particles in the spectrum, this will not. Hold. Well, they, uh, you see what, if we have massless particles, this all shrinks to zero, but uh, uh, presumably, well, for this, uh, yeah, so the whole the whole ellipse and enlargement of ellipse uh, seems to all go, go away. Any questions from Mumbai? Thank you. 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 Thank you.